Welcome to AARP Connecticut in your community. Hi, I'm Elaine Warner. I'm on staff with the AARP Connecticut State Nonprofit Office, where we do advocacy and community outreach. We come to you in your local community with AARP's purpose in mind, and that is to empower you to choose how you live as you age. Today's show is titled, The Future of Caregiving Post-Pandemic. We hope we will empower you with the information we will present today. And, and I just wanna uh, present some facts at the beginning of the show. They're rather staggering. Nowhere has the impact of the coronavirus been felt more than in our nursing homes. Nationwide, more than 40% of all COVID-19 deaths have occurred among residents in long-term care facilities, while more than 3,000 have died in Connecticut, accounting for 74% of all COVID-19 deaths in the state, those numbers as of the summer of 2020. It is thus critical that we reflect on lessons learned and how we can apply them to the future of caregiving, including bolstering our at-home caregiving services. And my guests today, again on the show, the future of caregiving post-pandemic are very well informed to do just that, reflect on lessons learned and look ahead. First, I'd like to introduce Anna Doragazi. Welcome, Anna. And here comes Anna. Hey, Anna. Anna, hey, nice Holly. to have you back on the show. I'm great. Uh, and Anna is the ARP Connecticut Associate State Director for Advocacy and Outreach. Anna, your role uh, is to plan and execute AARP advocacy campaigns in support of ARP legislative and policy goals. You do that both at the state and the local level. And caregiving and social isolationism have certainly taken center stage. I've heard you say uh, that you've been extremely, I know you've been extremely focused on the uh, topic, but that you've stated you'll be spending the majority of your time on caregiving and social isolationism into the near future. So we look forward to your knowledge and your insights on today's program. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Sure. And I'd like to uh, welcome Mairead Painter. Welcome, Mairead. Hey, Mairead, there you Hello, are. And Mairead, you. yeah, thanks for being here. And the uh, Mairead is the Connecticut State Long-Term Care Ombudsman with the Department of Aging and Disability Services. Mairead actually has four other titles, which we will get to. I keep saying to her, I don't know when she sleeps, she doesn't. Uh, but Mairead in her role as the Long-Term Care Ombudsman, uh, program, head of that program, promotes and protects the quality of life for older adults and individuals with disabilities. And uh, your program, Raid, serves 30,000 plus residents in Connecticut in 400 skilled long-term care nursing facilities, residential care homes, assisted living, and managed residential communities. And in your role, uh, I know you identify issues, you develop policies, regulations, and legislation to improve the quality of life for residents receiving, uh, receiving rather support services. We are we are so glad you are there doing that and heading the program parade, and we look forward to sharing your uh, experiences and your expertise. So, um, let's go first, Marade, right back to you. Uh, if you can tell our viewer, just elaborate a little bit, and we'll put websites up and phone numbers for people to access information, but talk about the Connecticut Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, if somebody's not familiar with what it is, please. Sure, thank you so much. So many people have never heard the word ombudsman or know what our program does, so I really appreciate you having me on today. Um, our program works with individuals in long-term care settings. So if you are a resident in a setting or a family member, you can reach out for confidential um, information related to care services and advocacy. Uh, our program consists of myself, the state ombudsman, eight regional ombudsmen, and then three administrative positions that will answer the phone, connect you, they'll kind of do a sort of interface with you, figure out exactly what the needs, is, needs are so they can get you to the right person. Um, we work with individuals to help inform them of what their rights are in each of these settings. Many times people have questions or concerns related to um, the care and services that they're receiving, or maybe it's just understanding how they move something forward or what they have the right to ask or receive. So not everything involves us getting um, involved with a case. Sometimes it's just information and consult. 
However, there are cases where there's a question of abuse or neglect where we help either the person self-advocate or we might investigate the case if that's what the resident wants. Um, one of the things that makes our program very different is that we are all resident advocates and centered on what the resident um, wishes and we take direction directly from the resident. Sometimes a friend, family member, or even a staff member might call and tell us a concern related to a resident. We go and talk to that person directly to see what that person wants us to do. Um, and the other unique part about our program is we are not mandated reporters. We're some of the only people in healthcare settings that are not. So residents can feel secure in talking to us and knowing that what they tell us is confidential. We then would help advise them on, again, what their rights are and maybe some different paths that they could take to find resolution. And that's at the direct care level in the nursing home where in my role, I do more system advocacy and work at a state and federal level to make sure that the voice of residents are heard beyond the walls of the nursing home and that they're represented. So thank you. Well, you know, that's great, very comprehensive. And uh, I, I want to stress again that the services, as you stated, Mairead, are free and they are confidential. That, that is really critical. And uh, when I introduced you, I said you, ha you wear a lot of hats, uh, to say the least. I'm, I'm going to just very quickly mention some of the other uh, roles that you play. And they are a mouthful, I got to say. Uh, let me, I hope I've got them all right here. For, and if you can just respond to each and, and the impact of that on today's subject. You are also the first vice president of, of the National Association of State Long-Term Care Ombudsman Programs. What do you do? there and the impact? So as the first vice president for NASOP, I take the experience that I have here in Connecticut. I work with other state ombudsmen and we come together to make sure that um, as a country, we're looking at issues and concerns related to older adults, how um, changes at a federal level might impact them and using our strength together collectively to ensure that individuals get the highest quality of care. Great. And I always, you know, at ARP, we, uh, Anna and I are colleagues at the nonprofit office, and we interact with people across the country for ARP. So sharing best practices is always a, a great asset. You are also the co-chair of the Coalition for Elder Justice in Connecticut. What role do you play there, Marie? As co-chair for Elder Justice, we are really, our goal is to partner with both public and private entities to ensure that we're able to help individuals living across the spectrum of care, um, whether they be in our community at large or in a long-term care setting, that they're, they're safe, that they have the right to live in a safe and appropriate way. But if something comes up, that they can reach out to us and we have the experience, whether it be through a state agency or a private agency, to connect them to the information and help ensure that they're respected, they get the response that they need and the information they need in a timely manner. And that's so comforting because we as family members and friends of loved ones, we just, we can't be there all the time and safety is of the utmost concern. Uh, you are also the co-chair of the Medicaid Long-Term Services and Supports Rebalancing Initiative Steering Committee. I think you have the longest title of anybody I've ever That's a show. long, that yeah, is a tell long us. title. Yeah, so what do you do there? So, and um, as co-chair, I'm very thankful to have AARP as members and Anna is on that steering committee with me. And that steering committee is better known as the money follows the person, um, was originally what it was, and now it's moved into right size rebalancing. And we really look at ways to ensure that every individual, no matter their payer source, has the choice to receive their long-term services and supports in the setting that is most appropriate for them that they have access to assessments and information to inform them of what's out there. I think many people think that long-term care services means you must be in a nursing home. And we know that Connecticut's done a great deal of work around this. We continue to press forward and we wanna ensure that people have choice and that settings are accessible to them outside of long-term care. Not that that's a bad choice because for some people, Living in a nursing home is perfectly appropriate and what they want, but we don't want them to think that that's their only choice. And we wanna make sure that that information is easily accessible. And um, if they do decide that, that they actually can move that forward. So that's what we work on in that steering committee. 
it, and Mairead and Anna, we know from statistics that most people want to age with quality and dignity in their own community. I, I know for my father, he was in his own community, but he went from independent to assisted to skilled nursing, and that all worked well for him. And, and some of you watching would much prefer to be in your home. So uh, we're talking today with a focus on nursing homes and assisted living uh, facilities, but uh, much of this applies to caregiving in the home as well. And we're going to get right to that, actually. Um, Mairead and Anna, you, ARP and the Long-Term Care Ombudsman's Office have partnered uh, before the pandemic, during and post, all of the above. So uh, there have been many issues that you've both uh, weighed in on. I'm just going to sort of read a laundry list and, and sort of address each of you on this. Anna, let's start with you. Virtual visitation. Uh, how did you partner and what roles did, did ARP play in that? Sure. So early on in the pandemic, um, one of the first um, executive and agency orders that we saw coming out of Connecticut state government was around visitation in um, nursing homes and assisted living and other, um, you know, long term care facilities. And, you know, if people can remember, um, I know it seems it seems like ages ago, but um, back to March of 2020, just as we were starting to see a spike in COVID numbers, um, you know, in Connecticut and then eventually nationwide, there was still a lot of unknowns about the virus and how it was transmitted. Um, but what we knew was that it was killing people and that it was very prevalent in nursing facilities. So, um, you know, right away, I believe it was March 13th of 2020, we saw um, an order come out that um, ended, basically ended visitation in nursing facilities, except in um, you know, certain very limited circumstances. Um, at the time, I think that seemed appropriate, especially as we were looking at this really rapid increase in um, sickness and in death in nursing facilities. Um, but, um, you know, AARP and I know, um, you know, Mairead and, and her colleagues as well, we said, okay, it, you know, th this is important. We need to keep people healthy, but also it's critical that we keep people connected. Um, you know, people need to be in contact with their, their spouses, their partners, their children, um, their loved ones. Um, and as we were still trying to understand, um, it, you know, what, what was COVID, how was it spread, how, how were people impacted, we immediately went to, there are other ways to talk to people like, like we're doing right now. Um, right. I think we're all, you know, very accustomed to working over Zoom at this point. Um, but AARP on our end, you know, right away, we started reaching out to the governor's office, to the Department of Public Health, to legislators to say, okay, you know, Maybe this is an appropriate solution to, to restrict visitation, but we can't do that without also ensuring that there are other ways for folks to stay connected. Um, by May of 2020, we saw um, an order coming out of the Department of Public Health that requires nursing homes um, and other long-term care facilities to facilitate um, alternative means of communication, I think is what the order says. Um, so whether that's um, talking to folks over Zoom or FaceTime or Skype or, you know, any of the technology um, or doing window visits, um, but that order required and, you know, still, still requires facilities to offer one of these alternate forms of visitation um, at least once a week as a way for um, people to, to stay connected to their loved ones. Well, and and we're if you're just tuning into the show, uh, this is about the future of caregiving post pandemic. Uh, I'm Elaine Warner. I'm with ARP. We're hosting uh, the show. Anna Doragazi on staff as advocacy and outreach uh, with the ARP office, and Mairead Painter is with the Long Term Care Ombudsman's program in Connecticut. Uh, and we're talking right now about our partnership with each other. Uh, Mairead, iPads. That was a godsend, was it not? And and what happened there? It really was, and I'm extremely thankful. We had talked um, early on with AARP and talked about having access, and I'm always thankful for the partnership that we have and that we're able to really come together and move things forward quickly, right? We get a lot of those um, barriers out of the way. And so one of the things that we learned was that um, something called CMP funds, civil monetary penalty monies. So if a nursing home or a long-term care community, community is fined, that money goes into a pool of money that's then accessible to help um, better the lives of residents in those settings. So that money became available during the pandemic to assist and the Department of Public Health applied for and was able to get 
a large stock of um, tablets, iPads that went out to every nursing home, depending on the size of the home, depending on the number that they received. Um, our program has now purchased iPads in partnership um, with AARP and Oak Hill in order to get them out to residential care communities and ensure that those residents also have access to um, family members, friends, community at large. So really looking at technology and how we can think of things differently, um, both during this pandemic and moving forward. I see this as sure. an opportunity. Moving forward, we're gonna do things in a different way and um, really hope to keep people connected to their community at large, um, even outside of this difficult period of time. Absolutely, uh, what a what a great uh, service you provided there, and not only the uh, iPads, but uh, technology training too, so that people be, could become familiar both uh, residents and uh, employees. Anna, cameras in rooms in nursing homes and facilities. Uh, talk to our viewer about uh, ARP's position on that, please. Sure, and this is another issue um, where we were really pleased to work with uh, the Long Term Care Ombudsman Program. Um, and this issue for us um, in the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program preceded the pandemic, um, that we were looking into giving nursing home residents, um, it, not, not as a requirement, but as an option to install uh, cameras in their room. Um, and the way that AARP approached this issue was that if you live in the community in Connecticut, you have the ability to install cameras in your home. Um, and a lot of people do, a lot of people have cameras that make it easier for them to, um, it, you know, some of these are two-way cameras where you can um, easily visit with somebody who's offsite. We have cameras in our home so that people can keep an eye on their pets when they're at work or, mm -hmm. you know, make sure their kids come home from school on time. And we think that it would just be appropriate to give nursing home residents that same opportunity to install a camera in the place that, that they call home, which is in, in the nursing home. Great, and again, love the partnership with you too. Uh, Marae, staffing and testing. Ooh, so staffing in general. <laughs> um, so those are two really big topics, right? Um, staffing in general, I will say for long-term care communities, this has been an ongoing challenge prior to the pandemic. And again, something we've partnered on. Um, we've needed to increase our staffing numbers here in Connecticut for a long time. Um, we have one of the lowest staffing rates um, in the country at 1.9 hours a day. I will thankfully say we do not have buildings typically running at that rate and that we use the federal guidelines of the ability to meet individualized needs. And that's been very important during this pandemic. However, it's also really hard to measure if someone's individualized needs are being met or we're not readily able to get in and see that, right? And for residents to be able to express what needs aren't being met and when, so um, were they not able to take the time to fully finish their meal because the aide was having to get on to the next person and to assist with that nutritional support or using the bathroom or even um, support in getting dressed or being um, appropriately cared for and groomed in the way that they see appropriate. That sometimes is what takes a back seat. Um, and so we know that staffing has been a challenge. We've really advocated for high, higher staffing levels. Um, this was also impacted by the pandemic because we know as people became ill, there were less staff readily available to go in and care for people in the nursing homes if there was an outbreak. That also relates back to the testing. So moving forward, staff um, will continue to be tested. We know that our state, um, very different than most states in the way that they approach this, and I have to say I was thankful with AARP and we're advocating for ongoing testing because we felt it was incredibly important that we know that nursing homes, assisted living communities and residential care homes do not want this in their homes. They wanna keep their residents safe. How do you do that? Once this gets in, it spreads very quickly. Sure. Um, when the pandemic first started, we know that we had issues accessing certain types of PPE and testing. And so through our advocacy, we thought it was really important to make sure that all, all homes had appropriate PPE and our state through the Department of Public Health and the governor's office had sites where nursing homes could go, alert them that they didn't have what was appropriate and go pick it up or even have it delivered to the buildings at some points. Um, and then when it came to testing, 
um, with the CARES Act, it kind of rolled forward that they, we were going to start a testing strategy here in our state where the state was providing um, sort of that connection to labs and helping nursing homes in their assignment to these labs that were going to come in and test staff and residents. And so this happened and went through the summer. It then paused if homes did not have any positive tests. They continue to test staff on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. And then if there's any positive tests, the residents also begin to get tested. You'll see in some of the numbers that have been released, um, it doesn't match, right? People say, oh my gosh, that doesn't match the full number of staff and residents. I wanna be clear with people, that's because they don't test people who have tested positive in the past 90 days. So that's why sometimes there's a difference in that number and um, people, although they're alarmed by that, just make sure you're understanding if someone tested positive in the past 90 days, they wouldn't be a part of those numbers. Gotcha. And, and I and Anna, I know that was a big uh, issue with ARP as well. So much more to talk about here. Uh, glad you mentioned PPE, uh, Marae, personal protective equipment. We all know what PPE is now. Never heard of that before, but now we, we all know what it is. Uh, very briefly, Anna, because uh, as usual in our show, there's never enough time for all we need to talk about. But uh, May I assume correctly that going forward with the Connecticut General Assembly, a new session going into a new year, depending on when you're watching, uh, end of one year into the next, that, that you'll continue your partnership uh, as far as a legislative agenda as well? Absolutely. We, we love working with Maraid and her team, um, and we've been really fortunate um, it, to have a lot of similar goals when it comes to um, keeping residents safe, um, you know, both, both in um, you know, nursing homes and long-term care facilities, um, and also making sure that people have real choices, um, which I know, you know, is a, is a shared goal um, that we that we have with Maraid and her folks as well, is that making sure people are receiving care in the setting that is most comfortable for them and that's most appropriate for their needs. Um, so I, I imagine we're going to have a lot of overlap in our legislative agendas and keep working as, as good partners, um, you know, hopefully for a long time to come. Yeah, you're going to be seeing a lot of each other on Zoom, mostly probably, is where that will be. Uh, and and you just said about people wanting to age wherever they choose to. You know, our goal again at ARP is to empower you to choose how you live as you age, uh, which is a good timing for me to mention ARP's website, arp.org forward slash caregiving, very comprehensive website, uh, wherever you want to age uh, with, with dignity. Uh, we offer a lot of resources there for you. Uh, Mairead, very quickly, I know the state of Connecticut, uh, again, given the disproportionate uh, numbers of people in uh, long-term care facilities affected by COVID, uh, they hired Mathematica and a partner, Yukon Center on Aging, to conduct an independent assessment of the COVID-19 impact uh, on what we're talking, focused on mostly here today, nursing homes and assisted living. If you can just very briefly give us some highlights of uh, what came of that report, please. Very important report. And I was very thankful that our governor asked for that to be done in an independent way. And from that report, what we've learned is that um, there weren't a lot of huge surprises, but I think it confirmed for us a lot of things that we knew that staffing was an issue that in areas where people um, maybe are in, there were higher numbers in the community, we saw higher numbers in those nursing homes, um, that that had a real impact. We also learned from that that residents access to visitors, their social and emotional needs, the ability to have those met, have an incredibly high impact as well, almost as high as COVID-19 and that we need to be able to balance that. From that, our legislature has called for another um, group, a work group to happen through the nursing home and assisted living um, work group and oversight work group, um, NAWOG. And I am the co-chair of the visitation and caregivers work group. And we're really gonna take the recommendations from the Mathematica report, each of these subgroups and see what we can do in a way of legislation to move it forward in the pandemic, but to protect people moving forward if something else was to come up again. So we're very a report. We're going to really take the data from that um, in a positive way to try to move forward and see change. Great. And uh, Marie, I'm going to just mention your uh, last title again. I said you are wearing all these hats. The And this happened recently. Uh, 
depending on when you're watching the show, but you are the co-chair of, here's this big title again, Socialization, Visitation, and Caregiver Engagement Subgroup of the Nursing Home Living Oversight Work Group Committee. And I know both <laughs> ARP and the Long-Term Care Ombudsman's Office is very happy about this because we did want representation that had a direct communication line with the residents. Correct, Anna? Yeah, absolutely. Um, AARP would have loved to see um, you know, a resident on that uh, work group as well, but we, we know that Maraid's a really strong voice for that community and um, you know, we, we appreciate her leadership and know that you know, good things are gonna come out of that working group. Great, and Anna, I'm not gonna give you much time for a big topic, so you're gonna have to boil it down. Nursing home immunity. I know ARP has a has a real strong position on it, and there's various positions out there. But if you could sort of, in a nutshell, just state ARP's position, please. Sure. So right now, there's an executive order in place that um, makes nursing facilities um, and hospitals as well immune from civil liability for um, it, bad outcomes due to COVID. It's kind of the quick way to say that. Um, we think that nursing home residents deserve accountability, and we would like to see um, that executive order overturned, you know, either by the governor himself, or we'd like to see the legislature get involved in um, getting rid of that. Great. So that, that's going to be an on, ongoing topic as well. And, and, you know, we've been focused today on post-pandemic caregiving, uh, but we all know people love to uh, or wish to age with grace and dignity in their own communities. And there are other programs, the <clears throat> home care program for elders, the home and community-based services. Uh, Anna and uh, Moraid's uh, uh, contact information will be on the screen, uh, as will mine. So if you're, if you're yearning for more information, whether it's caregiving in a facility or in an at-home setting, uh, we can provide that information to you as well, and we'll put up the websites. Uh, so again, I want to thank both of you. Uh, Maraid, any, uh, again, could have you on for a couple of hours easily, uh, and we may, we may return to the subject. It will certainly be ongoing. Uh, but any lasting thought uh, for our viewer at all from you, Maraid? Yes, we want to hear from you. If people have questions, concerns, or they want to volunteer, please reach out and let us know. We have volunteers that go into long-term care settings, not this moment, but, at, but we hope for that, a return of that in the future. Our contact information is there, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maraid. And Anna, same question to you. Any, any words of wisdom you'd like to leave with our viewer? Sure. Um, I just want to kind of quickly thank Marie again for her ongoing partnership um, and also to say to folks who are listening out in the community that your input really matters. I know um, I'm sure Marie would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you. And also your lawmakers would love to hear from you. You, you have a real opportunity to help shape um, the conversation when it comes to long-term care, either in nursing homes or home and community settings. So please reach out, make your voice heard. Um, and yeah, you're, what you're experiencing is real and we'd, we'd love to hear about it and help, help elevate your voice. Well, th thank you both. You are two super advocates uh, for the challenges of caregiving ahead. Maraid Painter, the state long-term care ombudsman in Connecticut, Anna Doragazi, ARP Connecticut Associate State Director for Advocacy and Outreach. Thank you for advocating for our older Americans. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck. And I want to thank you for watching today. If you are a member of AARP, you are amongst a half a million people, at least in the state of Connecticut. Thank you for that. Thank you for your viewership. And uh, if you're interested in volunteering on a subject like this or any of our advocacy issues, please call me Elaine Warner, Program Specialist, Volunteer Engagement, AARP Connecticut, 860-548-3169. We will see you again in your local community with AARP's purpose in mind, and that is to empower you to choose how you live as you age. Thanks for watching.